Hello and welcome to Gender and Literature course for NPTEL. So we just finished covering a few texts that we have uh, discussed quite extensively. So we have finished looking at Shatran Shri Kilari by Munshi Premchand. We have finished looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, George Orwell's Shooting an Elephant, and most recently we finished reading uh, Catherine Mansfield's short story The Fly. So one of the things which runs across this particular all these texts that we have covered so far is the use of uh, you know, how gender is negotiated with, how gender is sort of reconfigured in the course of the text, how gender is something which is politically produced, something which is culturally constructed uh, and obviously whatever can be constructed can also be deconstructed and reconstructed. And we looked at the ways in which uh, certain gender expectations are subverted, uh, sometimes conformed, sometimes subverted, sometimes challenged, sometimes interrogated in all these texts that we have covered so far. Mm -hmm. So each of these texts, if you look at it from a certain lens, from a certain perspective, whether it's Prim Chams, Shatter Jikilari, or Always Shooting an Elephant, or Conrad's Heart of Darkness, or uh, Mansfield's The Fly, and each of these texts we find a certain expectation, a certain economy of gender expectation is produced, uh, and that economy is sometimes disrupted through certain experiences and certain behavioral codes. So one of the things which we found out uh, while looking at these texts is that how gender entails a certain set of codes. It's a very coded kind of a construct uh, and the codes can change. The codes can be reconfigured at any given point of time. The codes can be uh, you know, navigated with very creatively. The codes can be subverted. The codes can be conformed to, etc. So gender, and this is something we talked about at the beginning of this course when we looked at the theoretical components of gender. gender is a set of performative codes. So it, it carries a certain code of conduct, uh, a certain code of behavior, uh, a certain code of construction. And so it's very important for us to look at gender as some kind of a construct. So there is that, uh, you know, so it's, it's biologically informed, but it's not biologically overdetermined. It should not be seen as something which is biologically overdetermined. It's something which is culturally determined, something which is politically determined, something which is uh, ideologically determined. And this, this entire interface between biology and ideology is something which we keep saying uh, in each of the texts that we have covered so far, whether it's Conrad's text of the colonial condition, whether it's Mansfield's short story about uh, post First World War trauma and crisis, whether it's Shatan Shikilari by Premchal, which looks at transition from feudal masculinity uh, and certain kind of gendered codes which are there to a more capitalist kind of a gender location. So each of these texts uh, can be seen, may be read as a certain series of codes which are conformed to by the characters and sometimes subverted by the characters as well. Now, in this particular text, which we will do today, uh, we'll look at, uh, we'll take up a different genre of literature. So, so far we covered the short story and the novel. So, for instance, uh, in the Heart of Darkness is a, no is a novel, so though it can also be considered as a novella. Uh, and the rest of the text which you have seen are short stories and an essay, of course, by George Orwell, Shooting an Elephant. But this text, uh, the text we'll cover in this particular lecture is a text called Look Back in Anger by John Osborne. Now, it's, it's a drama. Right? It's a piece of theatre. It's performed on stage uh, quite extensively. It's a very popular theatre. Uh, it became a phenomenal success in uh, 1960s Britain and then it became something of an international, you know, uh, in a really big internationally. Many, many other places in the world, um, you know, hosted this, performed this uh, in different locations and different cultural conditions. And it's a text which sort of stands out in time. It's a very important piece of drama, a very important piece of theatre uh, from various perspectives. So what we will do today is we will look at what we always do. We will look at the cultural, political, ideological conditions which produce this text. So what were the conditions prevailing at that point of time which produce a, a drama like Look Back in Anger. Uh, so you know, because you know, as I keep saying, uh, I keep repeating myself on this, but it's very important that you get this, that every text, every literary text is born, is generated out of a certain cultural context. And the context come together to produce certain kinds of literary texts which are uniquely reflective of their times. So, you know, whether you're looking at Shakespeare's Hamlet, whether you're looking at Kafka's short stories, whether we're looking at John Donne's poetry, whether we're looking at, you know, any film at any given point of time, each of these texts, if you read these as texts, if they're rich enough to be treated as texts, uh, we'll find that one of the things, one of the common things which these do is they're very uniquely and authentically and complexly reflective of the conditions of the times. Now, they might not mirror the times completely. They might question the times, they might uh, raise important questions about that particular time, they might interrogate the assumptions of that particular time uh, and they might also be reflective uh, in a very revisionist kind of a way of that particular time. Now, Look Back in Anger by John Osborne 
uh, is a very important piece of theater because it's deeply political, it's deeply ideological, it's deeply cultural, it's, 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 it's more let's say a cultural document of its times. So it really holds a very important, a very complex mirror uh, of the cultural condition, the political condition, the ideological condition of the times in which it is set. And it's very important, it's absolutely imperative on our part, reading the text, to look at that particular drama as a very important piece of political theater. Right? It is a deeply political theater. But obviously the reason why we're doing this, uh, why we're doing this particular text in this course is because primarily it's a very, very rich text from the lenses of gender studies. Uh, from the lenses of masculinity studies, from the lenses of uh, the female condition in England at that point of time, uh, from the international condition that was prevalent at that point of time. So it's global as well as local. It's something which is deeply political as well as deeply intimate. Uh, it's a very intimate play. It's about a man and a woman uh, in, in a very intimate setting, in a very domestic setting, but still manages to become quite international, quite political and quite ideological uh, in its very unique ways. So look back in anger. Uh, so this is what I'll do in this particular lecture a little bit on the, le on the next lecture as well. We will have four lectures on this particular text. So the final two lectures will be spent looking at the text in details. We will cover certain sections of the text in great details. We will take some passages which we will look and read in great details as reflective uniquely of the times. But what I will do in this lecture and partly in the next lecture as well, I will give you an overview of the cultural condition which produced look back in anger. So the first thing we need to know is the time in which this play was written. This play was produced and first written in 1956 uh, and was first performed uh, in Drury Lane uh, in England in London in 1956 as well. Uh, so the moment I say 1956 England, uh, one of the things, the, among the many things which should come to our mind uh, if you look at the time politically uh, and culturally is that this is the, a post Second World War England. This is a post colonial, a post imperial England. It is an England which has lost its colonial legacy, this has lost its colonial power, uh, it is sort of bankrupt after the Second World War. So we, we already saw how this, uh, this experience of exhaustion, innovation, uh, you know, depletion, uh, this was sort of coming in uh, even in a post First World War text like the fly. So even if we looked at something like Catherine Mansell's fly, which we did in the previous lecture, uh, the previous couple of lectures, we saw how deeply it is reflective of the exhaustion that England and Europe faced at that time. You know, the, the, the ideological exhaustion, the uh, cultural exhaustion, of course, the financial exhaustion. So, in, in every which way, it is the state of exhaustion, bankruptcy, uh, you know, and, and depletion. It is a very innovative, exhausted, uh, you know, completely depleted condition, which, uh, is, which, which is what is prevalent in Second World War England. Okay? And also this is something which was beginning to take place uh, post First World War. So we saw, we, we, we winded up if you remember uh, in, a, in reading of the fly by saying this particular text is very uniquely reflective of the beginning of the end of imperialism, the beginning of the end of phallocentricism, the beginning of the end of the supposed supremacy of the white man, the beginning of the end of the entire construct, the entire idea, the entire glory, the, uh, the, the glamour of the empire. So this was beginning to come to an end and the, the First World War was the first real blow to all these constructs and by the time we come to the Second World War, we find these constructs are all gone. They are completely on the way out, they are completely dying, they are decadent, they are, they are already dead. Now look back in anger, in many ways is a play about deadness, it is a play about decadence, it is a play about stagnation. It is a play which really uh, and, and very uniquely is reflective of the stagnation, the moral, intellectual, cultural stagnation, political stagnation, ideological stagnation uh, at that given point of time in 1956 England. And so this is the reason why we look at the year very, very carefully. It is a very important year. Uh, it is that time where things were changing a lot. Uh, England was no longer a global power, uh, a global player uh, in, in the world politics. So there are two new global players in world politics post Second World War were the USA and the USSR. And England was very much a part of the sort of secondary tertiary you know, ring. Uh, it was never really a part of the entire uh, global uh, political power system anymore. It was on its way out. The empire had ended and you know it was an exhausted, uh, innovated country. And more importantly, the entire idea of civilization in England, the entire idea of uh, cultural supremacy of England uh, was beginning to be revealed as, as, uh, as a bit of a, a false construct. Okay? So it is a play which inhabits that temporal point. 
where England as a civilization, England as a political power, England as a cultural icon was beginning, was increasingly questioned in terms of its supremacy, in terms of its supposed supremacy, in terms of its um, legitimacy as a powerful nation, etc. So, you know, this is a very decadent, depressing kind of a condition in which this play is being written. Now, there are a few things which you need to remember while we, uh, you know, read Look Back in Anger, especially if you're reading it from a political perspective. So, this was a time, 1956, when uh, two or three really important political events, cultural events came into play, which further worsened the condition of England uh, in terms of global politics, in terms of a global uh, location in uh, world politics. So, the first thing which we need to remember is that this is a time where the Conservative uh, Party was uh, sort of defeated uh, spectacularly by the Labour Party, which came to power uh, immediately after the Second World War. Uh, and it brought, it, it came to power with a whole host of changes, a whole host of promises for change, not changes, but promises of change. So, the, the, the Labour Party came to power in England with great promises of change. Uh, it wanted to bring in reforms, education reforms, cultural reforms, uh, social reforms. So, there was a great deal of euphoria when the Labour Party came to power. So, it was uh, basically uh, quote unquote a win for the working class. So, the working class people thought this was a time in England where uh, things are beginning, things will change. So, this is a move away from this very conservative idea of England as an empire nation into a more democratic idea of England as uh, an inclusive, uh, eclectic nation, uh, tolerant, um, you know, something of a, you know, self-critical, etc. But however, when the, when the Labour Party came to power in England, one of the first things which they did, and this is very important in the context of this play, is that they introduced a reform called the 1944 Education Act. Now, what the Education Act did, interestingly, was it offered uh, the promise of free education, free university education to all people in England, irrespective of the cultural and class backgrounds. So, you know, university education prior to this was confined, was limited, was a monopoly of the middle class, was a monopoly of the very wealthy privileged people who could afford to send their children to universities and public schools and universities. And we remember, uh, and if you read George Orwell's uh, essays on Burma, uh, you know, Shooting Elephant and also his entire novel called Burmese Days, you find that uh, it was a big deal to go to a public school in England because that was a school, that was a kind of school where you, know, you get a very, very elitist, a posh, privileged education, which will basically prepare you to be uh, an agent of the empire. So, from there, you go on automatically to uh, a very posh university, which would basically you know, give you this idea of privilege, superiority, etc. Now, that was, uh, you know, that was questioned increasingly uh, in England, especially after the Second World War, when the entire nation was bankrupt, when um, the empire was revealed to be a bit of a monstrous construct which was costing the nation a huge deal of money to maintain. So, the empire was no longer a profitable enterprise, a profit making enterprise. It was something of a dinosaur, something of a monster which was consuming England. So, it was uh, you know, very quickly set aside, put aside and England wanted to sort of had a, have a makeover into becoming a different kind of nation, uh, a more democratic, a more inclusive, a more eclectic kind of a nation. So, this is a setting which uh, you know, generated look back in anger. So, on one hand you have this euphoria of a Labour Party coming to power, promising great changes, social, cultural, educational changes. But at the same time, what we find in Look Back in Anger is that most of the changes promised for the Labour Party were thwarted. Uh, you know, they never really materialized. So, it was a big uh, case of disappointment, which was followed naturally by resentment, uh, you know, anger against the promises which were frustrated by, you know, anger of the, of the young generation of people who felt cheated uh, of their cause who felt cheated by the political, by the ideological cause which they had supported. So, the really title Look Back in Anger is quite suggestive of the political condition of the time. So, it is a play which looks back in anger at a time which it's not, it, it now holds responsible for the present plight. So, the present plight of England uh, as a decadent, uh, degenerating, corrupt, bankrupt country is now sort of looked at as being uh, done, as being caused by imper uh, no, imperialism. Uh, has been caused by the once privileged position England had, which was basically, uh, you know, making the wealthy people even wealthier, the rich people even richer. And you know, that was a circuit of psychophancy and privilege and entitlement which go on, went on forever at the cost of the common man, at the cost of the non-white persons, of course, at, at the cost of uh, the non-privileged, the underrepresented people in England and elsewhere. So, empire in look back in anger is, is looked at as a monstrous construct, as something which has consumed the present of England. It is that past of England which has sort of consumed the present of England. 
in a very, very evil, nefarious way. So the 1944 Education Act is a very important uh, subtext, is a very important point, political point in Lubbock and Anger, one that must be remem remembered while looking at the play. Now the other thing which uh, is important to remember in, in the context of Lubbock and Anger in terms of the political condition of the times was a phenomenon called the Swiss Canal Crisis, which was a crisis which almost uh, broke into a war between England and Egypt. Uh, about the occupation, uh, the, the control of the Suez Canal. And Egypt, of course, the President Nassar of Egypt uh, ordered the English ships to leave the Suez Canal uh, you know, uh, you know, very, very quickly with very short notice. And almost England wasn't happy with it. Uh, England wanted to exert its world power, its dominance, uh, you know, the once dominant position it had. It wanted to put pressure on Egypt in order to revoke the, you know, the ban on English ships. But it was a big loss of face of England because the Egypt, uh, the Egyptian government's decision was backed unanimously, almost unanimously, by the global agencies. So it was a big loss of face for England, uh, losing the Swiss Canal, losing the occupation of the Swiss Canal, which it had enjoyed over a period of time. So the entire uh, you know, idea of making Swiss Canal England free, uh, which was something that the Egyptian government at that time, uh, especially uh, President Nasser of Egypt, uh, ordered and ordained and got it passed, so almost unanimously supported by the global people, the global politics, uh, political uh, in the presence. So look back in anger is a play which among many things, it also includes the humiliation of England at that point of time. So it's a very angry, decadent, confused, helpless England, which all it can do is look back in anger at the fond memories of the empire, which it now knows to be a monstrous construct, an evil, monstrous construct. So it's something which, uh, you know, is not glorious anymore, it's not a white man's burden anymore, it's not a great civilizational thing anymore. So it's something of an evil enterprise which, for which England now is paying a heavy price. So the present generation of English men and women, boys and girls, and young men and women who just come out of universities, find themselves completely jobless because the entire nation is essentially bankrupt after the Second World War. So in many sense, we can see there's a very really deep and complex connection that one can make between uh, look back in anger and shooting an elephant and, uh, you know, uh, out of darkness and, of course, the fly. Uh, so there is this uh, trajectory of masculinity crisis, the trajectory uh, of, you know, gender crisis, gender relocation, gender reconfiguration, which we find in look back in anger. So it reaches this culmination, in a way, uh, that the entire, uh, you know, em empire masculinity, the entire post-imperial masculinity is very uh, complex and reflected in look back in anger through this play, through the plot of the play. Now, before I move into the play, uh, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about theatre technically, right? And this is something which I'll do extensively, and hopefully we'll have more conversations. We will have a conversation about this, um, you know, later at some part of this course. Now, one of the things which is very important to bear in mind is that the very idea of theatre is performative. So we talked about performativity at the very beginning of this course. We saw how gender is performatively produced, promoted, protected, perpetuated. We talked about this four Ps um, in, a, in the earlier lecture. And obviously, gender is something which is uh, always uh, a performance. It's something which you're performing all the time uh, with the agenda, with the intention of generating certain kind of economy of identities. Okay? Now, those identities can be hegemonic identities, those identities can be subversive identities, those uh, and identities can be conforming identities, those uh, identities can be non-conforming identities. So, in either way, uh, you're producing identities uh, through a certain kind of performance which relies on embodiment and effect. So, we, we spoke about all these terms before. We, we talked extensively about embodiment. What is embodiment? What is effect? What is performativity? Uh, how is performativity different from performance? So, all these topics uh, were extensively discussed at the beginning of this particular course. And so, this brushing up of what we have already done. Now, the reason why theatre is a very important genre uh, to look at when we look at the politics of gender is because theatre, by very default, is performative. So it's essentially uh, a performance. It's something that you're doing. You're playing a certain role. Uh, you're becoming uh, uh, Hamlet or Macbeth. You're becoming King Lear. So you're performing the role of King Lear. So in other words, you are already in a performative plane. So theatre is, in a way, uh, doubly performative. So if you're playing a certain kind of man in a play, you are being doubly performative because you as a person is performing and also within the theatre, you are performing uh, a, another role which is completely different from what you are publicly or otherwise. So if you're Macbeth, for instance, you end up being, uh, you know, you start up being a murderer and then become more and more complex and grey and ambivalent. 
and obviously that's, that may not be something which you are in real life. So, it is doubly performative in that sense. And also theatre is something which is uh, deeply uh, problematic in terms of gender production. So, we, we, we talked about if you remember one of the things which we did very early on in this particular course, we looked at Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare. The Twelfth Night as a play uh, is really complex because as I mentioned when we read the play, it is a play which relies often uh, almost entirely on performativity. So, it is a play where men women dress up as men uh, in a particular uh, cultural condition and we know of course, uh, you know is actually a male actor playing a woman playing a man. So, it is doubly performative, double negatives producing a positive. So, it ends up being a man playing a man etcetera. We saw that in Twelfth Night quite heavily in how gender identities are performed uh, and those are used uh, for protection, for perpetuation, for deception, uh, but also for some really complex emotional entanglements which we see in Twelfth Night quite extensively. Now, and in, in, in look back in anger, we do not have uh, performativity in the sense with what happens in twelfth night. So, no one plays anyone else in look back in anger. So, no one dresses up, no woman dresses up as a man, no man dresses up as a woman. So, we do not see that in look back in, in look back in anger. So, it is very realist play and one of the things which uh, I use as a term in look back in anger is a term called kitchen sink drama. It is a very important term kitchen sink drama. Now, what is kitchen sink drama and why do you use such a term, such an odd term while looking at a certain kind of theatre productions. Now, the very word kitchen sink as you know you might uh, sort of know, the kitchen sink is a place in the house, an entire house. Kitchen sink is a space which is most cluttered, which is more dirty, which is most gritty, which is most messed up, which is most uh, quote unquote real. Right. It is the least embellished part of the whole house. So, you know if you walk into a house and again we are talking about spaces and, and the politics of identity and production and certain kind of sp spaces and subspaces. So, we look we walk into a drawing room and you find that very uh, nice that is what people come and sit. So, if you think of Divan Khana in Shatan Shikilari, so you know immediately that is a place which should be prepared uh, to be dished out for public consumption. It is a semi public space right. It is a peri public sp uh, peri public space. It is sort of public, but at the same time it is inside the house. So, it is very public in the drawing room. Okay. Now, uh, uh, in contrast to that the kitchen sink in, in a particular house is that position is that site where we get the messy, dirty, uh, the, the most honest expression, the most honest presence of the house, the most real presence of the house and then the, the, that, that presence which is really there in terms of a cluttered uh, congested presence. So, when we say when we use the word kitchen sink drama, what we are obviously indicating or suggesting or symbolizing is a very realist kind of theatre, a kind of theatre which will uh, you know directly uh, issue any kind of romantic larger than life uh, made up kind of a setting and will rely almost entirely on realism uh, on you know very realistic production techniques, very realistic dialogues, very realistic settings etcetera. So, kitchen sink drama is that drama of very gritty realism. It is not just realism with a happy face, it is very gritty realism, one which evokes a resentment, one which evokes disgust, one which evokes a sense of discomfort because it is too real for comfort etcetera. So, that is the kind of genre a look back in anger represents and obviously, there is a very rich tradition of that kind of drama which you know John, you know, John Osborne draws on. Now, the other, other uh, theatre movement which was really uh, interestingly uh, produced and triggered by look back in anger was the angry young man movement. Now, the angry young man movement as you know was a very phenomenal movement in theatre and which subsequently was also uh, sort of spilled over into cinema as well. So, you remember all the 1960s films starring Marlon Brando, James Dean uh, and later on uh, you know other people in Hollywood as well and that sort of came over in our country as well. When if you think of the plays uh, the films of Amitabh Bachchan in 1980s. So, those represent uh, this very angry man who was very resentful angry with society with the system with the establishment which he thinks is not offering him the opportunity, the fair opportunity to grow. So, it is a system which is corrupt, it is a system which is based on nepotism, favoritism, it is a very really choked up system where there is no fair play involved, where there is no meritocracy, it all depends on what your, your birth, your entitlement uh, and your, uh, your automatic uh, legitimacy by dint of your privilege. So, it is that kind of a society which the angry young man is resentful of. So, he loads that kind of society, he is angry with that society, he is angry at that kind of a cultural condition uh, and he wants to change it. So, he is a bit of a rebel, the angry young man. He wants to change the system, he wants to you know, hit against a system which he thinks is complacent and smug and choked and super saturated and essentially flabby. 
So the flabbiness of the establishment, the flabbiness of the system is something he resents and he wants to break it down. He's a bit of an icon of class and he wants to change the entire things just so it opens up into more opportunities and do more of a meritocratic system. Now look back in anger, has a protagonist who basically, Jimmy Porter, so he, this is a play which essentially triggered the angry young man movement in theatre and subsequently in cinema. So you can see automatically and immediately that this is a play of great theatrical significance. So we talked about the political significance of Lubeck in anger, but at the end of the day, remember, and we should remember, this is a piece of theatre. And so it's equally important to understand the theatrical significance of Lubeck in anger in terms of its contribution to theatre at large. So it's sort of, it was a big, a massive contribution to theatre in terms of promoting and you know, triggering and anticipating and basically generating this movement of angry young man theatre. Okay? It's, so it's very, very resentful, it's very, very angry, it's non-romantic, it's very realistic, it's very gritty realism that we see in Lubeck and Anger in contrast to this very affected, artificial, romantic kind of rhetoric which is used in certain kinds of plays at that time. So Lubeck and Anger as a play was a very radical and experimental and refreshing departure from the culture of theatre at the time which relied almost entirely on effect on affectation, on artifice and romantic rhetoric. So look back in anger as a departure, as a massive departure, as a clinical departure from that tradition of theatre and it ushered in a new kind of theatre which was more realistic, which was angry, which sort of depended on gritty realism. It's something which related directly to the real conditions of life and so that became more popular, that became more relatable for the audience which came to see it. Okay? So look back in anger as a theatre which will arouse in you emotions, which will arouse in you anger, resentment, frustration, loathing, disgust, perhaps a combination of all these in very asymmetric uh, you know, categories of existence. Now, uh, I, just told, I just spoke about a little bit about uh, you know, how look back in anger is reflective of the cultural conditions of England at the time. This was post-imperial England, no longer a you know, global player in politics. Uh, basically a provincial country which is be becoming increasingly multicultural and is sort of, it is xenophobic, uh, it's, uh, it has a sort of fond nostalgic memory of the empire which is now gone and all that's left is a sort of you know, really romantic remembrance of the empire that some people have and for most people, the young generation of people who never saw the empire, never benefited from the empire, they look at the empire as some kind of an evil presence in the past which is the reason why they're suffering at the present. So empire appears in look back in anger as a very important construct which consumes the present, right? It's a construct from the past which comes to consume the present and that's something which is looked down upon and is loathed by the present generation of people in England, including of course the protagonist Jimmy Porter. Okay? So this is basically the, the sentimental situation in look back in anger, the emotional situation in look back in anger, something which we must bear in mind. Why is the play so angry? Why is the play so much about anger? What were the conditions which produces anger? What were the political, ideological, cultural conditions which produces anger? And the reason is, I've just told you, that this is a, really a combination of different categories of existence in post-Second World War, death of imperialism, you know, the bankruptcy after the Second World War, uh, you know, the Education Act, which promised a lot of change but did not bring out any change and of course the realization of England being a decadent uh, non-global play in politics anymore. Okay? So and just a bit of a digression before I really begin with look back in anger. This was also the time, interestingly, which produced a lot of spy literature in England, the most popular of which was of course Jan Fleming's James Bond. Now James Bond was produced in, uh, in the, around the same time as look back in anger was produced. Now, if you look at James Bond as a popular construct. It's basically a British fantasy. Uh, it's produced at a time when England was no longer a powerful nation. So James Bond becomes the embodiment. It's like a wishful fantasy of England, uh, of a spy agent who never dies, a spy agent who is uh, you know, endlessly endowed with money, with uh, you know, sexuality, with erotic energy, with libidinal energy, with muscular energy. He never runs out of cash, never runs out of dresses. So it's a fairy tale. So James Bond is a fairy tale. It's, it's completely unrealistic. And most importantly, it's something which was completely against the real condition of England's intelligence at that point in time. If you look at England's intelligence system at that point in time, MI6, uh, the English intelligence system was basically a very corrupt, a very decadent system. The two big spy intelligence systems at that time were obviously the KGB and the CIA. MI6 was never to be seen, it was nowhere, it didn't feature anywhere after Second World War. So James Bond is a fantasy of the British imagination. 
So he's that perfect British agent who never dies, who's got a license to kill him, and he's an essentially endlessly endowed with all kinds of capital, money, uh, you know, libido, uh, you know, muscular energy. He never runs out of these things. So it's basically a fantasy. And it's a very interesting continuation of the imperial fantasy of incessant and constant control. So James Bond is basically a post-imperial imperial agent, right? So he's part of the British fantasy at that point of time, uh, which was produced uh, as a bit of a wish fulfillment at a time when the real condition of England was quite decadent. Uh, it didn't have any cash, it didn't have any resources, it didn't really have much of money, it didn't really have much of an intelligent spy system, and most importantly, it didn't really have, it was increasingly having lesser and lesser political agency. So the political agency, the political legitimacy of England after the Second World War was essentially decreasing, dramatically decreasing uh, with the loss of the empire and everything else. So the two big global players in politics I just mentioned were the USA and the USSR. Now, if you want to read a really interesting novel about the real condition of the spies in England after the Second World War, a very good novel to read is John Le Carre's The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. It's a great novel, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold by John Le Carre. Now, that is a very realistic novel. It's a complete contrast to James Bond. It's very unglamorous. It's very, very, uh, you know, de-energized. Uh, it's a Cold War uh, kind of a novel. Uh, so basically, you know, 1956 at the time when the Cold War was beginning to take place, was beginning to happen, beginning to brew, as it were, between the Russians and the Americans. And England was nowhere to be seen, really. So it's sort of sided with the Americans, but as a peripheral support, not really as a, you know, core component in the entire battle. So the battle bet between America and Russia were the two frontal battles. And England was basically a second or tertiary player in the entire scene. So a spy who came in from the cold by John Le Carre is a complete contrast to James Bond. Because James Bond is this glamorous uh, fantasy uh, spy, the English British spy who never dies, who never runs out of cash, who never, who, who's never dead, who will never be captured, who will always win in the end despite being an underdog. Now in contrast to that, uh, you know, the spy in the spy who came in from the cold is a very innovated, uh, you know, de-energized, a cynical kind of a spy, which is more honestly reflective of the conditions of England at that point of time. So this is a time where we have two kinds of representations, as you can see. One is a wish fulfillment representation. You create a fantasy, you forge a fantasy, just to make you feel good about the empire. You know, you sort of don't want to think about the empire, and you want to move on and still think and still believe you are a global player. So the kind of literature, the kind of uh, production which comes out of this is James Bond by Ian Fleming, that which is basically a continuation of this fantasy, this British fantasy of power, of privilege, or superiority. Now, a more realistic description of England at that time is something like Look Back in Anger, which as a play, as I just mentioned, is basically a play about innovation, exhaustion, ideological exhaustion, financial exhaustion, cultural exhaustion. So, you know, there are several points in the play where the protagonist, Jimmy Porter, laments the loss of British culture. So he actually says that, you know, we are all becoming Americans. You know, perhaps all our children will become Americans at any given point of time. Now, again, this entire, you know, this fear of becoming Americans, this fear of losing uh, in your true cultural self is, again, a very masculinist kind of a fear. It's basically saying that we are losing our original pure identity uh, as, as British, as British people. So all of us are becoming Americans. All of us are becoming, uh, you know, this global, loosely constructed Americans construct. And, you know, and as a result, we are losing out on our pure idea of Britishness, whatever that is. So in a way, it's a very nostalgic play. It looks back, uh, not just with anger, but with nostalgia, with fondness, with uh, a lamentation. It sort of mourns the loss of a certain kind of power system. But on the other hand, it also looks back in anger because it does look back at the past and blames the past for what it does to the present, for what it has done to the present in terms of making it bankrupt morally, intellectually, and financially. So this is basically the cultural condition of look back in anger. This is what happens in look back in anger. This is what triggers what happens in look back in anger. And you know, we'll look at the play in, in, in great details in the later classes. But if, for the purpose of this particular lecture, what I'll do is I'll give you the idea of the angry young man. So what is angry young man? And why is he politically important? And you know, what is he doing in terms of looking at the entire play from the lenses of gender studies? Now, there are several women in Look Back in Anger, and the relationship between women and men in Look Back in Anger is very complex. So, on a very superficial, uh, straightforward reading, you find the woman, uh, you know, even a very superficial reading would reveal to us that the women in Look Back in Anger, they enjoy far more agency, they enjoy far more authority, they enjoy far more 
power over the men. Right? Now, obviously, the men in Lubbock and Nanga, they rhetorically uh, you know, possess power, they rhetorically possess uh, agency, but they really don't. So, this entire idea, this entire you know, debate, this entire tension between real power and rhetorical power, real privilege and rhetorical privilege is something which comes, keeps coming back in Lubbock and Nanga. So, the protagonist of Lubbock and Nanga, Jimmy Porter, is rhetorically angry, he's rhetorically left wing, he's rhetorically a rebel, etc. But in reality, he has absolutely no agency. He, he has no power to enact anything. He has no power to bring about any kind of change, social, political, uh, religious, and uh, cultural. Uh, you know, he can't bring in any change at all. So, all that he can do is he can sit in his armchair and scream at the world. Right, so, he's a very cynical, bitter person who is still 25 years old, uh, very young, but already cynical, already bitter, already exhausted, already tired, and already on his way out. So, he's sort of stuck in a condition which doesn't offer him much of a future. Right? It doesn't offer him much of a past either. We should look at the very interesting relationship between past and future and look back in anger. These are very political conditions and look back in anger, the idea of past and the future. Okay. Now, what happens to look back in anger uh, is sort of quite straightforward. So, in a nutshell, if I were to give you the, the story of look back in anger, is the story of Jimmy Porter, who is the protagonist of the play, and he lives in a little flat in Midlands, you know, obviously in England, and then he lives with a wife where, who is very poor. She comes from an uh, imperial background, Alison, Alison Porter. Um, you know, who's obviously, whose real name, whose uh, name prior to marriage was Alison Redfern, and he lives there with his wife, and strangely enough, with another friend of his called Cliff, Cliff Lewis. So, Cliff is a very working class friend of Jimmy, and the three of them stay together, and it's a very interesting relationship that they share. Uh, so, the, the relationship with Alison and Cliff is also quite interesting. We're never quite sure whether it's a very, uh, it's, a, an, it's an asexual uh, relationship, or there's an erotic angle to it or not. We're, not, we're never quite sure. I mean, we look at certain passages in the play later on, and if you read it, the entire play later, you'll find there are certain sections which almost makes you feel that maybe there's something erotic between uh, Cliff and Alison. But it's never really revealed, it's never really ex explicitly stated at any point in the play. It's just a very vague, nebulous kind of a thing. We never quite get to know uh, whether, what kind of relationship that is. Now, Jimmy Porter, who is a protagonist in Look Back in Anger, now he is someone from a working class background. Now, he comes from a working class background. He comes from uh, in a very you know, non-privileged kind of a background. But, as I just mentioned, this is why it's so political. Because of the Education Act of 1944, he was enabled, he, he, he had the ability, uh, he had the privilege or the opportunity to have university education. So, he went to university, got a degree, uh, but then essentially, and the reason why the entire education act was such a colossal failure was because despite the education, at the end, there was no job. So, what's the point of educating people if you can't give them jobs which are commensurate to their educational abilities, which are commensurate to what they've learned in universities, whether it's a technical education or humanistic education or scientific education, if they end up doing very, very unrelated, menial, lowly jobs, then the whole idea and the whole thing remains the same. Uh, it just gets w worse and more complex because, you know, on the one hand, we have these people like Jimmy Porter who are now university educated, who are now uh, have a university degree, the very fashionable degrees, uh, they speak perfect English, uh, they, they speak very culturally, but at the same time, they end up doing the same kind of jobs which their parents would have done. 30 years ago. So, we have this odd situation in Lubbock in anger, where Jimmy Porter, who is a university graduate, he ends up running a street stall. So, he runs a street stall in the market, along with many other people who have never been to university at all. Now, this condition, this particular image of a university graduate running a street stall is very interestingly symbolic and reflective of the cultural condition, the economic condition of England at that point in time. So, on the one hand, we have these people who, because of the 1944 Education Act, had been to the university and obviously they've gained a degree, but that had really produced no change because they end up working the same kind of thing which they did many years ago or the fathers did many years ago. So, in that sense, it's a very decadent system. In that sense, it's a very dissolution system. So, you know, these people are naturally and legitimately disillusioned. People like Jimmy are angry, they are resentful, they are disillusioned because they have been cheated of the purpose. Right? So, they were given a certain kind of promise, they were given a certain kind of opportunity to educate themselves and you know, with the hope of getting good jobs to move into the mainstream of society, culture, politics, etc. But that has never happened and will never happen. So, England remains a very hierarchical country based on entitlement, based on privilege, based on you know, 
uh, oligarchy uh, and based obviously on what your lineage is. It's a very class divided uh, you know, uh, society where there's a lot of hierarchy and there's hardly any equality between the classes. Okay? So in that sense, it's a very uneven country and there are good reasons to believe that Lubbock in anger, uh, Jimmy Porter in Lubbock in anger has lots of legitimate reasons to be angry. So those are the political reasons to be angry. So th he has some very good political, social, cultural, ideological reasons to be angry. So you know he is resentful of the empire. He's resentful of imperialism because he is left wing, uh, and he's got this degree from the university. But then at the same time, he runs a sweet stall, so he's completely agency-less. He doesn't have any real agency at all because he can't bring about any change. I mean, he's just a sweet stall uh, owner. Uh, and if you look at the play and if you look at the film, which we will at some point later, we'll find quite extensively that he runs a street stall, which is a little van-like stall. It's not even a shop. So as long as if he's got a big shop, a big establishment, which will potentially grow into a franchise or an industry, that's not the case over here. So he runs a little van, uh, you know, which he moves around with, uh, and he stands there uh, in, a, in, a, in a little market, an open-air market, uh, with the hope of selling his sweets. So that's something you don't expect. From a university graduate, you shouldn't expect from a university graduate because the entire purpose of education is to promote them, promote people like Jimmy uh, into uh, more dignified jobs, more complex jobs, more responsible and more reliable jobs, which never materialize in the case of this particular play. So there is this very uh, uh, strong ideological resentment, uh, political resentment against cheated promise against you know, uh, an erupt promise in Lubbock in anger. So that's one reason why Jimmy Porter is angry. But the other thing in Lubbock in anger which is quite complex is the misogyny of Jimmy Porter. So why is it so, uh, you know, you know, why does he hate women so much? Why does he have this very interesting relationship with women where he feels threatened by women but at the same time there is a certain kind of woman he loves uh, and a certain other kind of woman he lusts for. So, you know, the entire erotic economy in Lubbock and Anger is quite complex. And in that sense, uh, many people have compared this, in that sense it's quite comparable with that of Hamlet, uh, Sh William Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, in a way, we can read Jimmy Porter as some kind of a neo Hamlet, or some kind of a Hamlet in a new kind of setting where he's essentially trapped in a condition which you know, he doesn't know what to do, he doesn't know how to get out of it. So, he's someone who's torn between desire and guilt, torn between desire and resentment, uh, desire and disgust. He doesn't quite know how to negotiate or how to navigate across the two. So, he's someone who's trapped in this incessantly. So, that is a, the condition that Jimmy Porter finds himself in. And like Hamlet, which again will produce a very good gender studies reading. So, if you look at Hamlet, if you look at the, the, the woman in Hamlet, Gertrude, Ophelia, so these women, they become pawns. Uh, in the power play of the men. So Gertrude, uh, who is obviously innocent because she doesn't know that her husband had been murdered by uh, Claudius, and Claudius murders uh, you know, Hamlet, the, the king, the father of Hamlet, and then of course uh, he marries Gertrude, uh, and Gertrude is innocent because she doesn't know that Claudius was murdered, and of course Gertrude's marrying Claudius makes Hamlet resentful and anxious and angry because he has this uh, very complex relationship with his mother, very possessive, erotically, almost erotically possessive of his mother. He doesn't want to let that go. So the uncle becomes a, a, a bit of a father figure that he hates, that he resents. Okay? And then of course it gets more complex because we have the figure of Ophelia in Hamlet, uh, who is obviously Hamlet's lover, but someone in Hamlet abhors in the end. Uh, and then Ophelia is driven to suicide in Hamlet, and then Hamlet of course uh, feels repentance in the end, and he wants to exonerate, redeem himself. And then of course we see, you know, and if those of you who read Hamlet would know, there is this duel in the end between, Oph uh, between Hamlet uh, and Ophelia's brother Latus, and of course they kill each other with poison swords, which is something which was uh, you know, orchestrated by Claudius, uh, you know, the uncle. So the entire play Hamlet is a very strong uh, gender studies play that you can see. So you have this princely kind of masculinity uh, who is not military, uh, you know, and then he is expected to be this military man. He's expected to avenge his father. He's expected to carry out and execute his revenge, but he cannot because he's too much of a philosopher. He's too much of a debater. He's too much of an introspective uh, contemplator of life. So he cannot really carry out what is expected of him militarily. So in that sense, he suffers from a masculinity crisis. He doesn't know how to avenge his father. He's too much of a philosopher. He's too much of a thinker. And he's a bit of a thinker person. In, in contrast to Macbeth, who doesn't think much and does first and then thinks later. So we have this joke in Hamlet and Macbeth, don't we, that you know, we say, if Hamlet and Macbeth were in each other's positions, there would be no tragedies at all. Uh, because if Hamlet were in Macbeth's place, he would know immediately the replications of Cain and Duncan, and he would not do it. 
because he will think through it, and then of course he will, you know, he will, you know, move away from doing it. He won't do it at all. And of course, if Macbeth were in Hamlet's position, he wouldn't think of it so much and just kill Claudius uh, in one second, and that'll be the end of it. So there's this joke because you know these two people represent two different models of masculinity. So we have this uh, philosopher, uh, you know, scholar model of masculinity who's expected, unfortunately, to be this uh, military man. An Avengers father, which he finds very difficult to do, and so the whole play goes on and on forever, and it's quite boring that way. Because, but it's deliberately boring. That's what exactly Shakespeare wants you to say, uh, wants us to understand that this is an entire series of procrastination that happens in Hamlet. And so, likewise in Macbeth, uh, you know, he is someone who's not much of a thinker, uh, though he becomes a thinker in the end. But in the beginning, he's a military man, and he executes some, you know, something, and then thinks about it later, and that brings about his downfall. Now, the reason why I've digressed a little bit uh, from Lubbock and Anger, and now I'm going to come back to it, is because we see similar models of masculinity in Lubbock and Anger. So we have Jimmy Potter, who is uh, a bit of a neo Hamlet because you know, he is someone who thinks, he is someone who is very rhetorically angry, but he never really do anything, really. But of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a fundamental difference between Jimmy Potter and Hamlet, because Hamlet, remember, was a prince of Denmark. Hamlet had power, had privilege, had the royalty, had the royal agency. He could have done a lot of things if he wanted to. But of course, Jimmy Porter is financially, uh, culturally, ideologically, politically, he's, he's a nobody, right? So nobody would listen to him uh, and nobody would pay any attention to him. So all that he can do is he can scream from his armchair. That's all he does in the course of the whole play. He can scream from his armchair and then of course, he'll be resentful, rhetorically resentful, rhetorically left wing and that would really uh, you know, make it more complicated for him because he will end up doing nothing. And there's a very important section, an interesting section at the end of the play where the two women in Jimmy's life, Helena and, and his wife, uh, you know, Alison, they discuss him and they tell each other that he was born at the wrong time, he was born in the wrong age. He should have been living in the time of the French Revolution. Uh, that is the time, the glorious romantic times in which he can find himself situated. Now, uh, he cannot really function in this kind of a situation which doesn't give him the agency, the ability to execute his ideology. So he's essentially consumed by his ideology. He is consumed by his left-wing ideology. He's consumed by his bitter resentfulness against empire, against establishment, against this entire uh, you know, oligarchy, which is uh, masquerading as democracy in England, the sense of entitlement. So all these uh, degree of hatred that he has against establishment, empire, and then of course women, uh, you know, they come back to him, they consume him in the end, and that makes the entire gender location of Lubbock and Anger quite complex. Because you know, the men in Lubbock and Anger, like the men in the fly, they're essentially in the end, eventually helpless, uh, and they are cruelly helpless. Uh, they have a lot of cruelty against the woman. The women suffer and look back in anger. So it can be seen as a very interesting feminist text where we see how the women become a bit of a disposable commodities and look back in anger. They're used and abused by the men, uh, but by very weak men who have no agency, no political agency. So they vent out their frustration, their bitterness, their cynicism against the woman. And the women become sort of sufferers of this cynicism, sufferers of this guilt, sufferers of the stagnation that a men face in this particular play. So Jimmy Porter is basically a sufferer. Jimmy Porter is he suffers as at the same time he makes other people suffer as well, right? So he is in a way insufferable. So he's someone who is a complex uh, and a combination of contradictions. And we see that in the beginning of the play, and we'll read the beginning in due course. You'll find that he is a combination of sincerity and freebooting malice. He's a combination of great cruelty and great generosity. He's a combination of cheerfulness and absolute malice, absolute cynicism. So he, have, he has all these very contradictory categories, very contradictory attributes in him, which make him a very complex character, like Hamlet. Again, so if you look at Hamlet as a character, we find him very, very complex, and in the sense that he has all these contradictions uh, inside him all the time, which make him such a complex masculine presence. He doesn't know how to go about, he doesn't know how to strike a balance with the contradictions. So again, with Jimmy Porter, he is someone who suffers from a lack of balance. Right? So he's someone who is too full of contradictions. And of course, this is post-imperial England, uh, you know, post-1947 England. So the presence of India in Lubbock and Anger is very interesting. India is a very important presence in Lubbock and Anger. We have a character, uh, we have Jimmy's wife, Alison, who grew up in India as a British, uh, as an imperial British. So she is sort of used to a certain kind of privilege. She is used to some sense of entitlement, which she now doesn't have while she's back in India. So if you remember, if we connect, interestingly, if we connect, uh, you, know, uh, you know, George Orwell's essay, Shooting an Elephant, with Look Back in Anger, you might feel, you might sort of think that, and you know, Look Back in Anger belongs to the next generation. 
So people like Orwell in Burma were already getting cynical because they could see through the constructed quality of the privilege. But look back in anger is about the death of the privilege. The, the privilege is gone now. There's no privilege left. There's no imperial privilege left. So now the people have come back to England and now they are nobodies. So all the imperial agents who were in India uh, making the Bigfoot empire have now come back and now they are nobodies. So this again uh, you know, really in fosters or triggers uh, a sense of gender crisis. You know, the entire idea of the entire entanglement between gender and embodiment and agency and authority, uh, those really become problematic and look back in anger. And one of the figures which we'll study extensively in Look Back in Anger, when we read the play, is that of a person called Colonel Redfern. Now, Colonel Redfern is the father of Allison. Uh, so he's the father-in-law of Jimmy Porter. So he's a, a father of the wife of Jimmy Porter. Now, Colonel Redfern is someone who was in India for 30 years. So he left in England in 1917, and he was in the command of a Maharaja's army somewhere in India. We don't quite know which part of India that was. But he came back of 1947, when India became independent. And interestingly, after he comes back to England, he kind of recognized the England that he had left. Because England that he had left was an imperial England. It was very different. And he had, of course, got used to a certain kind of lifestyle, a certain sense of entitlement, a certain sense of agency, privilege, luxury, while he was in India. And that sense of entitlement, that privilege, that luxury is now gone because the empire has come to an end. So he's come back to England as a nobody. So he suffers, like the boss in uh, Mansfield's Fly, he suffers from a transition uh, from solidity to fragility. Okay? He has a supposed supremacy of his gender as a white man in a non-white space in an imperial setting. And that makes him feel as if he's very authoritative, very privileged. Uh, he's got lots of agency. But in the end, when he comes back to India after the death of the empire, he finds the entire privilege is now gone. It's disappeared. So interestingly, you find again a very complex negotiation between gender, embodiment and agency depending on political changes. And this is something I keep saying in the course of this, throughout this course. How these uh, very intimate categories like gender, uh, embodiment, agency, so things we think that these are very intimate, inward looking things, you know, these are actually determined and redetermined by external changes external political changes. So this entire interplay, this entire loop between the internal and external, between the neural and the ideological is something which we must be very, very aware of when looking at gender studies. So you know, in one sense, gender is what happens inside you. It's biological, it's an embodied thing, uh, so you know, it's, an, it's a neural thing, it's something which you feel uh, viscerally, corporeally, physically as people, but at the same time, gender also entails an extended embodiment. It, it entails a performative embodiment. It's something which is out there. It extends onto a public space. So you're supposed to perform gender. You're supposed to play out certain gender roles. You're supposed to enact certain gender roles. So in that sense, it's quite performative. In that sense, it's quite illogical. And in that sense, it's, it's quite uh, sort of extended into public spaces. So you know, this is loop between internal and external, ideological and neural, uh, you know, biological and ideological and cultural. So all these things come together in very asymmetric combinations while looking at the relationship between gender and embodiment. So Colonel Redfern and Look Back in Anger is a classic example of that kind of embodiment. So he is someone who once enjoyed his embodiment, who once enjoyed his uh, sort of entitlement, his privilege, his authority, etc. But now, of course, he suffers from that because that privilege, that authority, that embodiment is now gone. And why is it gone? It's gone because of certain political changes. India has become independent. The British Empire has come to an end. Uh, so it's on its way out. So no longer is Britain uh, a, a powerful country. No longer is Britain uh, a global player in politics, etc. The things we just mentioned. And so in a sense, we could read that England as a country has been emasculated. England as a country has been robbed of its masculinity. It's sort of exhausted its masculinity, exhausted its masculine privilege uh, as a country, as a nation. Okay, and that's interesting because what that shows quite clearly is that again this relationship between something which is a macro order, a nation, and a micro order of an individual. So Redfern is an individual. Redfern is a person, a, 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 a private space, a private self, right? But in a very interesting symbolic way, the emasculation that he faces as a person is reflective of the emasculation England faces as a country, as a macro country, as a macro organism. If you look at the nation as that kind of an entity, as a macro organism, as a collective organism, as a collective entity. Okay? So in a way, uh, and, th and that argument can also be extended to Jimmy Porter. So the cynicism of Jimmy Porter, the powerlessness of Jimmy Porter, the agency lessness of Jimmy Porter is very interestingly reflective 
or the powerlessness, the agencylessness, the helplessness that the generation of Englishmen and women face at that point of time. The people who went to universities, people from working class backgrounds who are promised jobs, who are promised change, who are promised great privileges, but then they now find themselves completely cheated of that promise. Right? They cannot carry out uh, you know, anything. They are basically doing things which their fathers did despite their education. So they feel disillusioned, they feel cynical, they feel bitter. So the bitterness, the disillusionment, the cynicism of, Lubak, of Jimmy Porta as a character, as an individual in Lubak and Anger is very interestingly reflective of the dissolution, the cynicism, the bitterness of the entire generation of post-1944 Education Act you know, uh, men and women in England who, who went to universities, uh, you know, hoped for jobs, expected great jobs, expected a good career, expected a good life, but then ended up doing nothing. So in a way, what the thing which we do and look back in anger as we move on with the play in the next lecture is we look at this constant interface, inter, interface between the interplay between the external and the internal, between the intimate individual and the public space, the ideological space which is out there. And they're constantly feeding each other, feeding off each other. So they, they're constantly informing each other, uh, you know, they're, they're constantly you know, influencing each other, uh, inspiring one another, in a sense. So the bitterness of Jimmy Porter is internal as well as external. The, 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 the helplessness of Colonel Redfern, who, who comes back to England and cannot quite recognize the country he had left, that uh, helplessness, that disillusionment, that uh, you know, uh, alienation that he faces uh, as an imperial officer now back in England is again the alienation that is collective alienation. So these are people who came back from India, these are people who came back from the colonies having lived a life of great privilege, entitlement, authority and now they come back to England they cannot recognize where they are nobodies, where no one really gives them special importance, no one really gives them special privilege because of the imperial background. That wouldn't happen anymore. So again, the empire is a very, very spectral presence in look back in anger. It's like a shadowy spectral presence, it's like Hamlet's father's ghost and look back in anger. It comes back to haunt all these characters, uh, either they make them feel guilty or they make them feel nostalgic or they make them feel bitter. But in, in a very interesting sense, the empire is always there and look back in anger. So in that sense, it's a very, very post-imperial play. And one which must be read politically, but at the same time, it's a play which really generates and yields fantastic readings out of gender studies. So this is the introductory lecture in Look Back in Anger. So the next lecture, again, will continue with the cultural conditions of the play, what were the, uh, you know, the reason why there are certain kind of moods which dominate the play, uh, the mood of bitterness, cynicism, despair, anger, uh, you, know, you know, helplessness. So why are these moods, why is this effect produced in Look Back in Anger? So to what extent is this mood political? To what extent is this mood, this effect political? This effect is ideological. And we will see, again, the interface, the interplay between the very private intimate effect and the political effect. So the mood becomes political as well as intimate. And of course we look at it from the lenses of gender studies. So we look at the same mood from the lenses of the man and the lenses of the woman uh, in the same political condition and we'll explore the differences as well as, as the commonalities between the two kinds of moods. So this concludes the first lecture of Look Back in Anger and we'll continue with this in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.